tota, arvon paasikiviseurilaiset ja muu yleisö, myös yleisö siellä linjojen takana. I'm Will Warby, welcome, Mr. Papua Svili, your honor, excellency, uh, Georgia's uh, parliament speaker. You are very welcome to here in Finland to uh, have a speech about current situation in this uh, your area and in globally. Welcome, welcome. thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here today and speak before you about Georgia and its irreversible European path. First of all, I would like to express gratitude for a warm reception, hospitality, and remarkably interesting and meaningful conversation we had at the Finnish government and the parliament. Paying the visit to Finland this year, as we celebrate the 13th anniversary since the establishment of diplomatic relations, is symbolic and especially valuable. Cooperation between our countries has been based on common European values and support for the rules-based international order. The Finnish nation's historic fight for freedom of choice and democracy, as well as Finland's model of the welfare state, serve as an inspiration for shaping Georgia's European statecraft. The history of Georgia is also full of wars. Our ancestors have demonstrated bravery, self-sacrifice, and dedication to fight for independence and liberty, and preserve our country along with its rich culture and traditions. War in Ukraine has not started in 2000. 22 in Ukraine, and it will not end there if Russia is left properly unanswered by the West again. Georgia also fought with Russia in the 90s and in 2008 for independence and liberty. Moreover, the history of Georgia's ties with Russia encapsulates many tragic events, including losing statehood, annexation and Sovietization, massive repression, desecration at our churches, of our churches and spirituality attempt to suppress identity and values. Thus, we perfectly understand what Ukrainians feel. The Russian invasion of Ukraine brings back painful memories, especially as Russian occupation troops remain sta stationed in Georgia's two historic regions of Abkhazia and Srinwali. Despite all odds, Georgia has been fighting since the very first days of uh, regaining independence and has always emerged as a democratic state. Georgia has been in a transition and thus challenges remain. However, Georgia's progress has been tremendous. Popular support for Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations are now explicitly written into Georgia's constitution. As a result of the constitutional reform that turned my country into a full-fledged European style parliamentary democracy. By signing the EU-Georgia Association Agreement in 2014, Georgia has upgraded its relations with the EU European Union to a qualitatively new level and since then has launched ambitious European integration reform agenda across all sectors to further advance political association and economic integration with the European Union. Up until today, Georgia has implemented up to 45% of the association agreement commitments. Georgia's democratic re resilience has been demonstrated by the state institution's ability to cope with the post-2020 election political turbulence, manage the COVID-19 pandemic, and most recently navigate the catastrophic regional upheavals caused by another war between Armenia and Azerbaijan and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and doing so without sacrificing its core democratic practices. In the past decade, Georgia proved itself to be a valued and reliable partner with its responsible foreign and security policy, which helped to maintain stability in Caucasus and broader region. We showed our dedication in Iraq, Afghanistan, Mali, Central African Republic, Kosovo, 
and elsewhere wherever needed and called for by our European partners. A memorial graveyard of fallen soldiers in Tbilisi, as well as meeting with their daughters, sons, family members, remind us the high price Georgia paid for our international partners and the global peace. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to outline that at this moment, we are not talking about immediate membership, but granting a candidate status to Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova. While becoming a member state may take time and there is a dem demanding process of further reforms and negotiations, the European Union must send the right signal now to overwhelming pro-EU associated trio countries by granting a well-deserved candidate status. It will have the potential to provide people with a cause to rely behind and the reassurance that it, in these uncertain times, a better future is on the horizon. Geopolitics triggered the application. Therefore, the European Union should take geopolitical decision while granting a candidate status. If the European Union does not hold the line now, the Moscow might interpret it as a green light for more aggressive actions. Not granting an European Union candidate status to Georgia and two other countries will leave Georgia and all three member countries dynamically developing democracy exposed and dangerously vulnerable in an otherwise turbulent region. Europeanization and democratization have been closely interlinked and granting a candidate status to Georgia will have a transformative effect and stand as a drive for further democratic reforms. Therefore, it is a moment, a moment of truth for the European Union and credibility and legitimacy of its international actorness. Being at this strategic juncture, the Union should demonstrate its long-term interest toward the region by granting a candidate status to Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine. This will be a right historical decision that will allow these three pro-Western countries to get closer to the space which they truly belong to. Thank you. Yes, we shall stay here. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting speech. Um, uh, I was Prime Minister at uh, 2019. We have well, much discussions in the European uh, Commission, uh, with European Commission, European uh, Council about new member states. And I, I think that um, Finland is uh, one of those who is most, uh, most likely to have this kind of view. Uh, countries into European Union, and as you say, there is much work to do, do too uh, for we reach that uh, situation. But it is on the uh, Eurasia continent. It's very important for uh, have this kind of discussion. How do you see this situation uh, in Ukraine uh, on your area uh, deep, deeply? Yeah, um, actually, uh, we hear nowadays that it was maybe hard to predict that uh, Russia's aggression, Russian's aggression will happen in Ukraine. But on the other hand, if you look at uh, the developments back in 2014 in Crimea, Ukraine, back in 2008 in Georgia, back in 90s and generally the pattern of uh, international politics or how Russia makes its international politics, um, I think we would agree that uh, this aggression could be predicted. But now we are there and now the question is, uh, what should be the answer? And um, at least now, I think we all should also realize that the lack of the uh, clarity in answers in 2014, in 2008, brought Russia to that point and brought the whole world and uh, especially Europe to, to 21st February 2022. And therefore, um, we see what, uh, what are the possible 
answers and possible ways uh, which could work in this case. And one of them is the, uh, uh, is the application of these uh, three countries, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. Um, and uh, now uh, it's uh, like literally a matter of days to uh, decide and matter of days to take a historic step and to not to repeat uh, the, uh, the mistakes uh, from 2014 and 2008. Um, the same goes to the NATO membership and um, aspiration uh, of, uh, in this case, of Ukraine and Georgia, but of course uh, Finland. Mm -hmm. And also there we have experience uh, from back to 2008 Bucharest summit, where the, on the one hand we had a decision of the summit that Georgia and Ukraine will become a member of, the, of NATO, but on the other hand we did not get any clear way and path for how we can uh, be, get the membership in NATO. So I think it's important now uh, seeing these two processes like EU membership or EU application, NATO application, I think it's important that uh, uh, Brussels 2022 will, should not, uh, that it, Brussels not, no, not repeat the mistake of Bucharest 2008. Mm. Um, as uh, for the um, security situation, which of course uh, the aggression of Russia against Ukraine um, creates also for the whole region and in this case also for Georgia. Um, of course, uh, many of you are aware that uh, the, the Georgia is a country with 20% occupied territories by Russia. Um, up to 10,000 Russian soldiers on Georgian soil, and literally a couple of hundred meters from the highway with the occupation line and Russian soldiers beyond this line or on this line. So, of course, these uh, risks and threats are imminent, and we feel it, uh, uh, and the, 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 the citizens who are living along the occupation line, um, they feel it, and they, they, they are captured, they are uh, kidnapped, and uh, it's, a, it's a daily, daily challenge for the, for the Georgian government. Um, and especially, um, therefore, uh, uh, solidarity and support from Western countries is uh, uh, much needed in this uh, hard time. How do you see the relations uh, between Ukraine, uh, between Turkey and, and uh, Russia now? And what is the, your point of view of to, to Turkey? Um, as for the uh, Turkish position, and um, when we speak about the region, uh, of course, and uh, Georgia uh, is always ha has a good relations with Turkey or Azerbaijan and Armenia, only neighbor we we have not so good relation is Russia actually, and it's also um, not uh, not our fault. Um, uh, as for the Turkey, we, uh, we, we of course, uh, it, for, for us, the most important issue is that the Turkey, as a NATO member country, is uh, on our border, and it's some, uh, this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, arguments for us uh, for uh, accessing the NATO and being a NATO, NATO member country. Um, for the... Um, Turkey or the relations between Turkey and, and Russia, it has also its uh, historical um, explanations and arguments uh, in back in the 19th century and beyond. Um, but um, we, we see that um, uh, Turkey is also trying to play its role in the region. Um, uh, and uh, in this case, um, yeah, it could be differently explained, but um, as from our perspective, we are actually welcoming the, uh, the, 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 the positions uh, Turkey has uh, um, as for uh, Georgia's uh, aspirations um, uh, towards NATO and generally in the region. How much has this situation in Ukraine, the invasion for Russia, Im improved to your economy and your uh, in inside or also in your society now? Uh, the situation, the invasion to Ukraine yeah. from Russia, how it has improved to your society? Um, 
of course, it has a general impact uh, in the world economy, and uh, I think every country feels it, and this is the more or less the same for, 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 for Georgia. Um, uh, by the way, Georgia is one of the countries who has less dependence from the, uh, as for the energy sector from Russia. Uh, just 6% of gas is imported from Russia. So uh, from this perspective, actually, the dependence of Georgian economy from Russia's economy is not so high as uh, from, uh, uh, for other uh, countries um, in Europe. Uh, just to give you some figures about the um, uh, economic ties with Russia um, and also having in mind then the impact, the total um, uh, trade uh, turnover between Georgia and Russia is $1.5 billion, which is, which is uh, quite a small amount um, uh, from the European perspective. Um, um, as for the uh, uh, economic development so, and for, 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 for the trade relations uh, with Russia, it's mainly from Georgian side, <coughs> it's mainly agriculture products. And as I, as I mentioned, we have uh, not so big dependence uh, as for the um, energy supply from Russian side. And uh, therefore, on, on that matter, uh, they had not really a huge impact on Georgia. Yeah. No, it's possible for audience to uh, ask. Yes, there is. Kiitos. Paula Kokkonen, former member of the Finnish Parliament. You said that there is an invasion of Russia. Did you refer to Abkhazia? And could you develop a bit of the question of Abkhazia? How can it be solved? And what is the time reference, if you... No, uh, thank you. Mm. Yeah, actually, the, the, the last 30 years of uh, relation between Georgia and Russia, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a history of, of, uh, of uh, struggle, fight, etc., but uh, not only in Abkhazia, but the uh, Trinwali region. And most recently, in 2008, it started in Trinwali region, and, uh, and the part in Abkhazia was also involved in, in it. Nowadays, um, the, these two regions are officially occupied. Uh, before 2008, uh, Russia tried to, to act as if it was some kind of uh, mediator or some kind of peacekeeper. Um, but uh, after 2008, um, of course, it's now officially an occupation. Um, there are uh, there's, there's one risk, of course, we see that uh, uh, Russia changes policy of occupation to policy of annexation, and uh, which is, of course, a threat for, threat for Georgia. But uh, um, uh, as for the, uh, as for the uh, regions, the present uh, Tsrinwali region and the relation with the people living there, um, Georgia has... Uh, um, many times declared that uh, the only way uh, to regain the territorial integrity is a peaceful way. Um, and therefore, um, we, um, our policy and, this, and the application to the EU is a part of this policy to show uh, to our citizens in Abkhazia and in Trinwali region that uh, Georgia offers more prosperous, more uh, progressive, and uh, more um, development-oriented society and statehood. So um, this, is, uh, this is a long way, uh, but this is the only right way. Um, uh, we, we had in the past uh, uh, the military, uh, military conflict, let's say so, and um, uh, for the future it's uh, important that is long, but the only right way um, is all then that we go this way. Our ambassador, have you something to ask? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, could you maybe elaborate a bit more the kind of the plan B, should you have one, in case of the variant uh, positions that the European Council or the Commission should have on the TRIO uh, accession plans? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. As I 
mentioned in my speech. Um, actually, um, to my understanding, in my position would be that there are uh, there are two criteria the uh, European Council can will t can take a decision on granting the candidate status. One is on merit, and then there we have a lot to present, uh, um, be it in side association trio or even beyond it, and uh, having also in mind the comparison with other candidate countries. There are studies on how the countries, um, what is the progress of the countries by implementing the association agreement made by uh, Brussels-based uh, institutions like SEPs, for example. Um, and in this comparison, Georgia is leader in association, associated trio in all criteria, rule of law and sectoral, etc., in implementing the association agreement. And they have also made a comparison with the uh, candidate uh, countries from Balkan, Balkan states. And in some aspects, Georgia is um, even, um, even in, a better, in a better position than some of the candidate countries. And moreover, um, if we take another uh, dimensions of comparison, and uh, uh, which are made by different institutions, as an example, um, uh, corruption perception index made by Transparency International. Uh, according to the recent uh, index, corruption perception index uh, published by uh, Transparency International, Georgia is on place uh, 45th uh, on the list and ahead on up to nine EU member countries. Um, if we take uh, doing business index from World Bank, uh, Georgia is uh, if I'm right, it's, uh, it's on place seven uh, on the list. So if, <coughs> if the criteria is based on merits, then Georgian deserves, Georgia deserves to, uh, to get the candidate status. And then is another dimension which I mentioned. It's a geopolitical dimension. And <coughs> I underlined it because um, um, even the position of, of my government was, uh, and, we had it, and did we had it, and still a part of our electoral program was to apply uh, for the membership in 2024. Uh, so it was one of the, uh, let's say, elect promises uh, to, to the citizens uh, back in 2020 before parliamentary elections um, to prepare the country for the application in 2024. But the aggression of Russia against Ukraine and the changed geopolitical situation um, changed also the attitude of European Union. And it, and it was European Union who opened the possibility for, uh, for the application. Um, we know that uh, normally uh, to, um, to, um, uh, to, 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 to develop a uh, questionnaire for the country, needs several weeks or months. Uh, in this case, uh, it took several days. We all know that uh, the time the countries have to answer the questions um, are months or even years. In this case, we were asked to deliver our, answer, our answers in four weeks, and we did it. Uh, so, and the explanation is geopolitics, and because it was geopolitical decision from European Union to open this possibility um, for not fast track for the membership, but fast track for the candidate status, maybe or fast bureaucracy. Let's let's form it in that, uh, formulate it in that way. Um, and I think that uh, because. Uh, the decision to open this possibility and to offer to apply for the candidate status was based on geopolitics. Also, the decision on granting the candidate status uh, should be based on geopolitics. Um, you know, there, there, there we, of course, uh, there, there is a discussion and will be discussion about how whether, whether the countries are prepared. Um, but there should be a question, prepared for what? If you are speaking, uh, speaking about, uh, from the perspective whether the countries are prepared for the membership, of course not. None of the countries preferred, no Georgia, Ukraine or Moldova, none, none, of, this, none of these countries prepared for the membership. 
But we are now speaking not on the, about the membership, but on the candidate status. Uh, of course, we understand that the candidate means per definition that uh, something, someone is not prepared and should be prepared and supported in uh, on this way. And of course, uh, we and my government understand this quite well, that to become a member of uh, European Union, a country should be fully in line with Copenhagen criteria, fully implement and approximate the institutions and le legal system to the European legal system and uh, EU acquis. So this uh, is uh, the next step which should be taken. Now it's about the candidate status. status. So um, the answer on the question would be, I, I would really hope that uh, no plan B will be needed because um, because uh, it's, it, has a, it has a technical, political and emotional um, side. Technically speaking, uh, I just described that uh, Georgia is advanced in many areas which is uh, needed uh, to, uh, to, to get the candidate status. Politically, I think that um, the... Uh, yeah, I mean... That I, I, I don't think that I have to explain how important it is to send the signal of solidarity to the Georgian people and to send the signal of resistance to Russia. And emotionally, um, this is something what Georgian people were uh, fighting for, waiting for, working for, and hoping for, for many decades already, um, if not many centuries. To come back to the European family, where we think we were co-creators of the European culture, where we think we, uh, in, the, in, the, in the present, are with all instruments we have, with, the, with being uh, a, a, a line uh, NATO alliance without being a ally actually, but being in all hotspots uh, of this world uh, to support our NATO allies, to be together with European Union on security issues in Africa, Mali. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, at least um, um, the attitude uh, or the, the hopes we have that uh, hopes we have that um, we do n will not uh, need a plan B. But if, um, I mean, uh, all in all, at the end of the day, we are looking at our country, at our citizens, and uh, we do the things not uh, because, uh, um, not for, for being a member of one or another, we, we do it because uh, to, to improve the to the life of, of our citizens, to improve the quality of life, to bring the welfare and to bring the prosperity to, the, to our nation. So this is actually the number one aim. And, um, uh, but um, again, I, will hope, I would hope that uh, no plan B will be needed. Uh, if I ask so, that, is it possible to describe what is the strongest issue, uh, reason for the membership or candidacy to the EU? Is it security? Is it economical, cultural, value, values? Or what is the main reason? Could it, could it describe? Um, especially in last months, we saw that it's a choice uh, it, based on values, choice which part of civilization, country or nation want to belong to. And um, this is the choice which, uh, which Georgians, um, which was made in Georgia or by Georgians, uh, as I mentioned, for many years. And even if we take now the figures about uh, how, how, uh, how big is the support of the EU membership, or okay, candidate status, NATO membership, is more than 80 percent, according to all polls, uh, made from different institutions, more than 80% constantly uh, during all these years support Georgia's EU membership, Georgia's NATO membership. Um, it was even before uh, our independence in the 90s in when, the, when the, in, uh, the movement for the independence and freedom start, start, started, but was more active, let's say, in the 80s, 
um, that uh, that uh, already there at that time, uh, at that time it was NATO and NATO security umbrella, uh, which was one of the goals uh, that nation had actually. It was discussed uh, uh, be between the people at that time. So, um, I mean, uh, the 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 so the the uh, emotional part is to, um, to come back to the European family, by the way. The oldest European was found in Georgia. Um, second oldest person, uh, second oldest um, um, human um, uh, on the world. So the, the, the oldest one was found in Ethiopia, as I know, and the second oldest and the oldest in Europe, in Georgia. And by the way, the oldest wine, um, like, um, you know, chemicals were found also in Georgia, dated with uh, uh, 8,000 years old, um, I mean, the, some kind of rest of the wine. So, and this is actually the feeling our people uh, live with, that uh, we are n not only a part and we do not strive to come to, uh, but to come back to the European family. Uh, and, of course, this emotional part, I mean, um, but, uh, of course, um, the way of living uh, and economic welfare and uh, freedom, uh, which, uh, and th these are all the words uh, you associate with Europe, Europe um, in the meaning of European Union. That's a very good, yes, please. May, wait a minute, May I microphone is on. Now in uh, Abkhazia and uh, no, South Ossetia uh, under Russian rule, I'd like to ask you uh, what percentage of the people uh, stayed there when, when, they, when these uh, territories were lost? And, and how are these people treated? And can they travel? And, and, and how, how, how do they keep? Yeah. Thank you. Um, as you are maybe aware, um, uh, in in the 90s, when there was a, a war, and I mentioned also uh, that uh, the um, you know, military confrontation with Russia started in the 90s in Georgia, um, uh, there was ethnic cleansing in Abkhazia and in Srinwali region, where the Georgian population was forced to leave um, uh, the territories. We got uh, uh, up to more than 300,000 uh, uh, internally displaced uh, people um, after um, this um, uh, ethnic, ethnic cleansing. Um, and uh, there are, as for the uh, ethnic composition um, in uh, Abkhazia, there are not so many Georgians ethnically. Um, uh, but also it's not easy for Abkhaz people uh, and this is also something where the, uh, where the, um, the uh, problem of uh, ethnic identity is also uh, one of the issues in these territories, be it in Abkhazia or in Srinwali region. Um, of course, uh, when you speak about occupied territories, uh, the, uh, the terms like the human rights uh, and uh, m uh, freedom of movement and freedom of uh, being, uh, have, have uh, schools in the native language, etc. These are, are non-existent or relative terms and therefore, of course, all these freedoms are not provided there uh, in the manner it should be provided. Uh, they are, um, uh, I mentioned that in Srinwali region, in the middle of Georgia, uh, along the occupation line, um, the people living there, they are, are constantly under threat to be kidnapped. And it uh, takes uh, then several weeks and months for Georgian government uh, to somehow um, uh, arrange that the people are freed. Um, so these are the gray zones, gray zones with, uh, with the limited possibility to, uh, to implement the human rights. Um, as, uh, um, as an example, to, as, as already mentioned, um, 
in Abkhazia, the Georgian schools are closed. You cannot re uh, learn uh, or uh, go, go to schools and have a lesson in Georgian language, which is also, uh, of course, a problem for the uh, ethnically Georgian population there. Um, and um, yeah, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's a, uh, of course, a closed grade zone um, with no free movement possibilities uh, and uh, other, other problematic issues which, uh, which are connected with the status of being occupied territory. Could I ask some question? Um, I've discussed with uh, some years ago quite much with Albanian, uh, Northern Macedonia and, and uh, Montenegro's prime ministers about uh, their situation, the geopolit geopolitical situation. And they said that uh, there are very many uh, interests uh, from China side, from Russia for Turkey, and especially um, while they are interesting uh, themselves of European Union, European Union. Have you had uh, that kind of interest from China side or uh, yep. is there infrastructure um, building or, and or something like that? Um, generally, geop so historically, but also now Georgia was on crossroad between Europe and Asia. It was um, part of the so-called Silk uh, Road uh, and uh, this is the role Georgia is trying still to play. And therefore, many interests, also historically, but not also in the present, very inter very, 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 very many countries or has an interest uh, in Georgia. Um, of course, um, as for the uh, infrastructural projects and other and spheres on sectors of economy, we are open economy and therefore have a cooperation with uh, all interesting countries and. Uh, Georgia, um, due to the economic collapse in the 90s and uh, due to the uh, still, um, 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 with the economy which is still not um, on the level it should be actually, uh, is dependent from, uh, uh, from uh, foreign invest investments. So therefore, of course, uh, the Georgian economy is open for the investments. Um, as for the um, China or Chinese companies, uh, they are active in infrastructure, uh, building uh, roads in Georgia, but uh, as for the, they are also the free trade agreement with China. Actually, Georgia is one of the countries who has um, a free trade agreement with China, with the European Union, which uh, also is um, quite preferable or quite uh, good economic, brings us in a good economic uh, situation. Um, um, so, more or less also did the same with Turkey, actually. Um, um, as I mentioned, as for the economy, Georgia is open economy and we actually, um, our challenge is to attract uh, investments and uh, therefore any investment is welcomed. Okay, now we have time for one question, if there is some question. I, he has a very uh, uh, tight timetable. You have been in uh, Norway and Denmark, Den no, no, Finland, Finland, and tomorrow we will uh, fly to, to Sweden. And, and tonight you have a, also a dinner with our uh, French society from yeah. our parliament. Yeah. 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 So as for the for the trip, um, um, uh, it's my, uh, for for me it's the uh, first time uh, in Finland. It's actually the first time in Nordic countries. Although I traveled a lot mm, as a private person, actually, but uh, somehow I didn't manage to be in the, that part, of, in this part of the world. And um, uh, now, in one week, we managed to be in Norway, in Denmark, in Finland, now in Sweden. Um, uh, and um, um, and one of the messages we are trying to deliver um, uh, uh, shortly before the the um, await, awaited. Uh, decision of the uh, European Council is uh, the message that uh, now is the moment of truth. Now is the uh, time and moment when uh, the people of Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova should uh, get a message of solidarity. Um, and the message of solidarity would be not just to open 
the door, uh, but also to say to the people a welcoming word. And this welcoming word will be, would be uh, granting a candidate status. So uh, we all hope that, uh, that no plan B will be needed. And um, that, uh, that, but at the same time, um, we understand that this is just the beginning. This is the moment when the responsibility on our side will grow, actually, and when it will get now serious <laughs> about uh, about the um, about the development of democratic institutions and about the um, uh, approximation of the institutions and legislation with the EU acquis. And this is obviously this will be in any case something with, which uh, we will we will enjoy to do, and um, uh, it's an exercise which. Uh, is something uh, which will uh, really give you also some uh, emotional um, satisfaction. So, please, um, um, uh, hope, please also pray for us uh, that, <laughs> that they, they pray for the European Council that it takes the right decision. I'm sure that Finland is uh, behind you when when you are yeah. looking for your road to Europe back. Thank you Thank very you. much, Thank you Mr. Very much. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. I know you have busy. You need to leave.